<laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. I am uh, Lieutenant General Retired Daniels, um, representing AUSA's Reserve Chair, Reserve Committee Chair. Be your host for this morning's events. Um, and then also the reception this evening. I know you all, you know, those of you, many of you will be there. It's really great to see yet another packed room full of folks that are really interested in hearing about what our senior leaders have to say at, um, regarding the reserve components, and in particular this morning, the Army Reserve. And the topic this morning being adapt, transform, and modernize the Army Reserve. So I hope you all enjoyed the panel this morning. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I am Master Sergeant Isaac R. Black, a member of the Army Reserve's communications team. And today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Lieutenant General Harder, our distinguished panel members, and today's moderator, who will guide our discussion on how the United States Army Reserve looks to adapt, transform, and modernize. However, before I introduce today's panel, let's kickstart our discussion with the Army Reserve video entitled, Twice the Citizen. way to prime our discussion for today. So at this time, now I'm excited to introduce our host, Lieutenant General Robert Harder, the 35th Chief of Army Reserve and 10th Commanding General of the United States Army Reserve Command. General Harder leads the largest three-star command in the Army with more than 200,000 soldiers and civilians with a footprint that encompasses all 50 states, five territories, and a presence in more than 24 countries around the globe. His previous general officer assignments include Commanding General of the 81st Readiness Division, Deputy Chief of Army Reserve, Chief of Staff for Army Material Command, and Commanding General of the 316th Expeditionary Sustainment Command, where he deployed in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. General Harder, over to you, sir. All right, thank you very much. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Hear me okay? Boy, I tell you, what an awesome day, awesome morning, awesome panel. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I just want to thank hey, AUSA, uh, General Daniels, great to see you out here. So thanks, uh, thanks for an awesome transition uh, as I came on board. Um, great video team. We got, you know, I think I see Carlos out here. We had some best warriors uh, in that, and some of our best squad folks out there in that video. Uh, I see some great, all the leaders in the room here. It's awesome. I see Bill Green over there. So I got Bill Green. I got Bob Pleskowski. So I got a full quota of chaplains. <laughs> here, uh, and I need lots of prayer, so that's, that's awesome. Um, do have my family here, kind of in the front row. My wife's taking notes, judging. My son, Jack. Uh, my son-in-law, Bobby Stevens. Uh, so harder, harder crews all in. Harder crews all in. So just, hey, just a few, uh, few opening comments, salvo, and then I don't plan to do a lot of talking. I'll turn it all over to this awesome team and Kelly Dickerson, um, but just kind of where my head is right now. So, uh, um, well, first to these panel members, right? So I, we reached out, uh, and when we were talking about doing this panel and, and talking about, you know, adapting, transforming, modernizing, um, my team had some ideas, but I can tell you, I reached out to every one of these folks, and without hesitation, they all came back and said, I'm all in, right? Now, I'll tell you, Miles, 
Miles was a little bit on the edge. Miles was awesome. He goes, hey, sir, I'm all in, but I got to clear with John Mohan. <laughs> and then John Mohan, yeah, approved it. So Miles, it's awesome to have everybody here. But listen, I know these folks personally. So Miles and Gavin down at the end, right? Battle buddies with me during AMC. I've seen these leaders in the trenches, right? And you get, you know, Miles was, uh, was serving kind of as the, he was Damo FM when I met him. Now the G, then the G3 kind of at AMC without a GO providing top cover, which he does not need, by the way. And he was driving, you know, he is a busy human being, but just a humble leader. So, and he knows a lot about a lot. So and same with Gavin Gardner, XO to General Perna in the crucible, now commanding the 8th TSC, and just an awesome leader who, who came on board and said, I'm all in. I understand the Army Reserve, and I want to make the Army Reserve successful because they understand how essential we are. We got Lieutenant General Chris Kroll, three-star from the Polish Army, charged with standing up their transformation command, which is kind of a combination of TRADOC our TRADOC and our AFC. Now, previous gig, Chief of Staff for Joint Forces Brussels, Central Europe, where he was part of developing the NATO defense plan. So you got some questions on that. That is the professional to ask. So thanks for being here, Chris. And then finally, last but of course not least, my battle buddy, Mark Landis, First Army CG. He is, you know, I've known Mark for, I don't know, five, six, seven years. We've done some geo training together. I can tell you this, Mark is all in on the success of your United States Army Reserve. He and his first Army team. So great teammates uh, up here, big, brilliant thinker, and we're ready to drive on some things to make a difference, right? And of course, my battle buddy here, Kelly Dickerson, Virginia Tech Hokie. We got some Hokies out there, I hear them. Some Hokies out here. Hey, listen, so where my head is before I turn it over to Kelly and the team to do this. Uh, Y'all have heard me say this, right? The Army Reserve exists for one reason, to build and deliver. We have one purpose, build and deliver combat-ready soldiers in formations at point of need and support of the Army. And we have to drive on that. Um, we are an essential enabling capability for the United States Army and the nation. I got, you know, love my Army Guard teammates. John Stubbs and I are, are friends and we're gonna drive on things together. But the Guard kind of provides strategic depth with combat capability. With your Army Reserve, and I know I'm preaching to the choir right here, we will be needed early and often. Early and often. We have 100% of kind of theater opening capability for the United States Army. 99% of the bulk fuel capacity for the United States Army exists in the United States Army Reserve. 100% of theater engineer commands at the two-star level. 100% of theater tactical signal, br signal br brigades. We have, I see Melissa Damsky out here, about 80% of interrogation assets for the United States Army. 70 to 80% of medical, 70% of water purification. My point is, Compo 1 goes, Compo 2 goes, we go. You go, we go. And if I have a concern, a challenge, right, is that when I look at the threat environment today, and I hear these other senior leaders talk about the threat environment, the secretary, the chief, the force comm commander. It's not if, but when. It's not if, but when. We get 39 days a year, and these awesome leaders out here, commanders, command sergeants, major, are charged 39 days a year to deliver readiness that might have to go right now. Mark's gonna do everything with mobilization, mob sites. We may not have the time. So kind of two avenues, I'm focusing right now on how are we being combat ready and get after what we have to do. And then to kind of build on that, it's kind of what the secretary addressed yesterday when she talked about think differently. When we talk about adapt, transform, and modernize, we're not, we're not just talking about new kit, but what are the things that we can do differently in the Army Reserve to get after that mission of building readiness now Right, and, and kind of what General Daniel started, the shaping tomorrow, building readiness for our future. And we gotta think big. Some of the things I'm churning through is, you know, task organization, C2, do we have that right? Is it, is, is it the right to deliver the kind of readiness that, that is required of us, right? Something like stationing and facilities. My time at AMC, my time as an RD commander, we do not have enough dollars to, to even come close to maintaining what we have. 
So why do we keep doing that? Why do we keep spending, what is it, Martin, $75 million for a reserve center? I get one every two years, you know, a couple hundred million dollars across the FIDEP. I could be off by a little bit, but we have a $4 billion deficit. Is there a different way to get after that? More lease space, more Fort McCoys, less Army Reserve Centers that are almost impossible to maintain. Keep the standard, you know, the standard that our soldiers deserve. And of course, I look at equipment readiness as an example. We can't maintain what we have at our reserve centers or even in our ECS. Not for lack of effort, lack of professionalism, lack of human talent. It's all about, quite frankly, resourcing. When we're resourced to 50% of the mechanics we're authorized, and then, we, uh, and then they're all military technicians, so when they're, you know, they're soldiers too, so when their unit goes, they go. Um, it's just a challenge. So do we pre-position equipment forward? Do we start building, you know, concentration sites of equipment where we can maintain it, limited amount for units to train with, and we centralize more of our equipment? We can't keep doing what we're doing. It's kind of where my head is. Now, I got to be careful. We are, we want to regionally align, but we are globally available. So I'm very conscious of what my boss, Freedom Six, he gets a vote in that, and how we, how he's got to deliver ready forces for the Army, and so. Uh, Safety tip, do what your boss tells you to do, right? <laughs> I learned that from General Perna. But that's just kind of my opening salvo. I'm all in, right? I introduced my beautiful family here. They're here supporting me. I got skin in the game, not just with uh, all these Army Reserve soldiers, but I got a son who's a platoon leader, just became an XO in the 11th Airborne Division in Alaska. And I know on America's worst day, he's going to be relying on the leaders in this room, Army Reserve leaders, and their soldiers and their formations to deliver something. And we got to be ready, right? We got to be ready. So that's where harder is. And so that's my opening salvo. And I'll turn it over to our brilliant moderator, Kelly Dickerson. I'm going to hand it over to an even more brilliant person, <laughs> Master Sergeant Black, as he right. has the voice. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. So now <laughs> I will introduce our distinguished panel. First, we will start with Lieutenant General Mark Landis who currently serves as the Commanding General of 1st United States Army. Prior to assuming command of 1st Army, Lieutenant General Landis served as the Commanding General of 1st Army Divisions East. Lieutenant General Landis' other general officer assignments include Commander, Security Force Assistance Command, and Deputy Commanding General Support of 1st Army Division. Lieutenant General Landis served in mechanized, light, airborne, and striker units in numerous command positions from company to three-star level. Lieutenant General Landis has spent the past seven years in units with a mission to advise and, and assist partner units. Yeah, we're good. We're good. <laughs> Next. I told him it's going to happen, so we're good. So, beside Lieutenant General Landis is Lieutenant General Christoph Kroll. Lieutenant General Kroll brings extensive multinational experience to the panel. He is currently the Special Assistant to the Chief of Defense of the Republic of Poland vested with the mission of overhauling the transformation enterprise within Polish Armed Forces. This mission includes leading the effort of adapting the non-material side of the Armed Forces institutional enterprise to meet the growing challenges of the regional security environment, which includes capitalizing on reserve talents. Continuing, we have Major General Gavin J. Gardner, the 8th Theater Sustainment Command Commanding General, is third generation Army and an Army logistician. He commissioned as a second lieutenant via ROTC at the University of Georgia and has, and has held all key assignments at all ranks. Prior to the commanding the 8th Theater Sustainment Command, he was the Indo-PACOM J-4, Director for Logistics and Engineering, and also commanded Joint Munitions Command in the 82nd Airborne Division Sustainment Brigade. Next, we have Mr. Miyamasu. Mr. Miyamasu was appointed to the Senior Executive Service in December 2018 and has been assigned to the U.S. Army Material Command as the Principal Deputy G3 since 2022. From November 2022 to July 2024, Mr. Miyamasu fulfilled the role as AMC's G3. Mr. Miyamasu is responsible for overseeing the requirements process for the command to include programming, operations, and analysis. In this role, he interacts with the sustainment enterprise and major subordinate commands. And last, but certainly not least, 
we have Brigadier General Kelly Dickerson. Our distinguished moderator for today, Brigadier General Dickerson currently serves as the Office of the Chief of Army Reserve G357 at Fort Belvoir. He previously served as the Deputy Commanding General for the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School, Special Operations Center of Excellence at Fort Liberty, North Carolina. In his civilian capacity, Kelly is Vice President and Head of Global Seller Risk Platforms for PayPal and has served with several financial technology firms. Thank you. Hey, Isaac, thank you. I mean, I have a voice like that. It's hard to follow up. Uh, hey, real quick. So first of all, thank you for all for being here. We're excited. I promise this is not going to be a question answer session. This panel here has already told me, get to it. So what I'll start with today is just kind of what we're here to do. So we want to discuss ways that the United States Army Reserve can adapt, transform, and modernize to ensure we are postured for the current threat environment. As you heard, it's not getting any easier for us, and we'll have potential potential uh, Kroll talk to us a bit of that as well. We have an expert panel. I doubt some of the, some of the most broad minds in the, in the industry, and I think just from a reserve component perspective, they know what it's going to take to get us ready, to mobilize us, and to employ us in combat. So there's some prepared questions, but I'm going to start with a scene setter so we get a little bit of a background here. So the U.S. and its allies must adapt, transform, and modernize to retain advantage over determined adversaries. What we do in the next few years must set conditions to prevail in large-scale combat operations, should deterrence fail. Clashwitz remind us the nature of war, a violent contest of wills to achieve political aims, is constant. However, the character of war, how, where, when, and with what types of munitions and technologies continues to evolve, and today at a faster pace than we've ever seen. The Army and the Army Reserve is following the Chief's guidance to continuously transform. This includes fielding new equipment and experimenting with new technology. Yet, as Ukrainian conflict has shown, technology alone does not guarantee success on the battlefield or the next war. We must be able to, most adaptable enough to learn at the tip of the spear and transform in contact, like our European partners are doing now. Similarly, we must transform how we approach training, organizing, and equipping soldiers in new and novel ways to make us more lethal and more survivable members of the joint and combined team. General Hardy said, think differently, think big. As I recall, when you first came on board, you know, there was no idea out there that is too stupid or too broad or too lofty for us to look at, so long as we're looking at the threat. So we'll talk about that as well today. So things that I think we need to get back to, sir, we're going to get back to the basics of shoot, move, and communicate, things I learned as a young private in the 1980s. We have to prepare for war. Most people in this room, as the SMA has talked about, we have not been to war. Those that have are already been long since retired. We have been in a sustained conflict. Preparing for war means the nation must prepare, and thus, as a reserve component, we must prepare as well. And we have to build habitual relationships you know, throughout the regions that we, we, will protect, we will fight in, but also the regions we must prevent other conflicts from happening. We've got joint partners here all around the room to prove to us we have the best allies and partners. And then finally, before we get started, I'll remind everybody the setting we're in. It's unclassified, so I'll steer us away from any classified discussions. But we're here today to talk about readiness for war. So I'd like to begin with General Landis. And certainly we talked about this before, but you've seen the Army Reserve in action in our exercises. You've seen them in combat. What are the things you've looked at in some of the exercises we've done, the training that we're doing, and, and how we're doing at the uh, CTC rotation, sir? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. And I just want to thank uh, Bob, you for allowing me to be a part of this, um, <clears throat> and then AUSA for providing this form. The First Army, uh, w we're the flip side of the coin, and so even though we're with you with pre-mobilization training, we're we're responsible for post-mobilization training. So, the you're coming through First Army in order to get topped off to make sure that you have. Uh, the training that you need, the resources you need before you go do a mission. And so I tell my leaders all the time, our job is to enable your readiness. Enable. I really like that word. And what am I enabling you for? This is the trick. It's the current COCOM demand, and then it's large-scale ground combat. And I, I have a split. And those two, uh, there's tension between those two. And so what you are doing for COCOM demand day to day is taking away from this idea of large scale ground combat in, in the training at the collective level that we need to do to be ready for that. And if you, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, everything you see on the floor, it's, it's constant observation, constant observation. And so, uh, and the things that, if you're looking at the current wars right now, the things that they target to really make an effect 
is C2 and logistics nodes. And so you all have to be ready to move and, and set up and move and set up and move. And so that type of training that we're doing is different than what we were doing in COIN where we were setting up these big depot level warehouses of supplies. And the hospitals were able to set up in the same location for 10 years. Not, not a mobile hospital that has to move every 24 hours. And so that level of training to be able to, to do it is significant. But the, you've got this demand right now of what you're providing to the COCOMs. And as Bob said, it's essential capability that you're providing. And so we're picking, we're picking units apart in order to get COMPO 2 and 3 units to be able to function downrange because there's essential capabilities that we need in Kuwait and Iraq and Syria and all, all these great locations, but they're pulling out of your base to do that. And so that's your trick, tyranny of time. It's the same thing that, that has been in the Army since, you know, before I was ever even conceived, you know, this tyranny of time. You always have too much, and so what are you going to do and where are you going to take risk? That's the key. And those are decisions that, that commanders and command sergeant majors and command teams should be making on a day-to-day -day basis of how do, we, how do we use this time to the best ability to get to what we think is important. And, and how, do we, how do we play this juxtaposition of current readiness versus, hey, what if we have to blow out? And, and some, I'm, even in the unclassified, some of you all, your units have a D minus date of readiness. That means you have to be C2 now if you're going to do it, because I have no time to go and top you off. You are going to get on a boat or plane before I can even get to you, because you have a D minus lat. Uh, and so th those units need to, need to make sure they can do that. Again, unclassified, whatever that mission is. So to, to kind of end where we started, I think I've seen over the last four years, uh, leaders struggle with how they're prioritizing their time. Uh, and I see where we're, we're, not being, we're not using to the maximum effect because we don't understand what our purpose is. What are we doing in this training event? How are we maximizing that time so that we get the most out of this? And then how are we reporting, hey boss, I did this during this AT or this uh, during this MUTA, but I didn't get to that and this is where I stand. And the more transparent we are in that process, especially when it comes to relationships with First Army, the easier it is for me to program resources and time in order to make sure that I, I get you to where you need to be, to be combat ready, to use your words. Because that's the focus. You gotta go do war fighting, you gotta be combat ready, and how do we measure that? So I really appreciate you letting me here, and I'm sure, I'm sure they'll have some great questions for you. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate that. So just to the audience there, a lot of commanders, command sergeants, majors out there. He said the word enable. First Army does not get us ready. They're not responsible for readiness. We as command teams are responsible for readiness. And sir, I think it's interesting you talked about the priorities. There are things you're not gonna do. You gotta be transparent about them. And with that, I'm gonna transition over to General Kroll. And, and sir, I know we talked about this a little bit with your staff and Eric. You know, the Polish Army, you know, you're, you're transforming in contact as well in a different environment where you're faced just to, the, uh, just to the east, a conflict. So can you talk to us a little bit about how you're approaching preparing combat-ready forces and any of the you know, uniqueness of the reserve that you have, sir? Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, General Harter, uh, uh, the representatives of uh, 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 AUSA, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to take part. You might need to pull that mic a little closer. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, General Harter, uh, AUSA representatives, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. I'm absolutely honored to uh, be part of this distinguished uh, 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 panelist team. Um, before I answer uh, 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 to your question, uh, I'd like to uh, provide you a little bit more context of this transformation we are ongoing at this moment. Uh, uh, giving you a little bit more details about the, the, the Polish uh, uh, reserve solutions as well. So unlike here in the US, uh, uh, it's every Polish citizen's responsibility written in our constitution to be in charge for security and defense of the country. Uh, uh, and this is, this is from my perspective uh, 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 a huge difference. Uh, however, uh, in order to uh, be more democratic, more uh, f uh, uh, 
uh, open to our society. In 2009, uh, our government decided to suspend uh, 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 conscription. And since that time, uh, uh, we trained only uh, volunteers. Uh, however, but everything changed uh, in uh, February 2022. Uh, just imagine two weeks uh, after Russian unprovoked invasion to Ukraine, Polish par parliament uh, uh, adopted law that changed uh, uh, our uh, uh, um, uh, obsolete uh, regulations into Homeland Defense Act uh, that established uh, uh, three types of reserve service and uh, also changed completely uh, uh, functioning of our uh, security environment, if I may say. Uh, for example, uh, almost uh, anonymous uh, 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 vote, uh, no objection, uh, uh, our parliament uh, task government to spend every year, every year, at least 3% of GDP on defense. Uh, we are, frankly speaking, uh, 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 transforming ourselves in contact geographically and, of course, uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, time uh, 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 is concerned. So very close to Russia, Belarus, and, of course, with very, very limited time. Um, however, um, uh, however, this, uh, uh, the whole process uh, uh, started almost immediately uh, and we decided to uh, 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 uplift our numbers of our, number of our army from 120,000 to 300,000. Uh, due to the fact that we handed over a huge amount of and donated a huge amount of our uh, 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 Soviet era equipment, we were forced to uh, 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 acquire new equipment. Uh, U.S., uh, South Korea, and Poland, and, and elsewhere in Europe. Uh, uh, my colleagues uh, from our other uh, uh, countries used to complain that whenever Poles visited uh, industry abroad, uh, there was nothing to buy. <laughs> uh, so uh, the point is that we have huge amount of new equipment uh, uh, influx to Polish uh, uh, army, and we have to change uh, 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 the trading and uh, uh, ensure that the old reserve, uh, as I said, 2009, we suspended uh, 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 our conscription. So the, 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 uh, our reservists from the Combo, C, Combo 3 are, uh, frankly speaking, uh, at least uh, 14 years after uh, real training. 20 year or even 30 year. So this is the challenge we are uh, 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 facing at this moment. And I will stop here. I have much more uh, points to, to, to share with you. Uh, uh, thank you, Chris. Hey, sir, I'll just, I'll just follow up then. Really, so 120,000 to 300,000. So it's almost two and a half times the size. And think about that challenge that our, our Polish partners are facing there. I know you were here just, uh, just uh, you know, last month or a month and a half ago with your team. What have you learned from what we're trying to do in recruiting? Does that apply at all to what you guys are trying to do? Uh, in our case, it's a little bit uh, different story because, because we have enough volunteers to take part in uh, 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 volunteer training. We have a little bit more complex system, if I may say. Uh, so uh, every year we train approximately up to uh, 40,000 uh, uh, recruits uh, for all kinds of service. Uh, uh, however, uh, this uh, 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 push to the limits our current uh, capabilities because these uh, the, the soldiers are, are uh, undertaking uh, the basic training in uh, operational units. So we have to change uh, uh, focus from uh, operational units to uh, um, reserve units and establish training capabilities uh, uh, in order. And this should uh, uh, release operation and units from this burden and uh, uh, allow them to focus on uh, 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 implementation of this new, new equipment uh, um, uh, and integration of uh, uh, subordinated uh, uh, tactical elements into the uh, to the proper proper level of uh, pro uh, operation. I appreciate it. So I know we had that deep conversation last month about that. And 
you think the challenges that you're seeing, and now you got the Tradoc and, and AFC portions of that together, and now it makes perfect sense how you're developing the training piece for not just uh, you know your current soldiers, your active soldiers, but a variety of reserve component right. soldiers of different right. flavors. So, I'll switch a little more to General Gardner. So, given that m the majority, as the boss had talked about, of the sustainment capability resides in the Army Reserve. You know, how is the active duty sustainment enterprise integrating with our reserve sustainment formations and things you can show us about then, sir? Thanks, Kelly. So, aloha. <laughs> aloha. All right, Susie. First off, thanks to General Harder and uh, AOSA for letting the guy with the uh, State of University of Georgia, I, I say it that way on purpose, education to get up here and talk to you. I appreciate the opportunity to be a consumer of reserve force readiness. All right, so that, you know, I did, first and foremost, uh, U.S. Army Pacific foundationally cannot do its mission set without you. So when we go, you're going with us. I can 110% assure you of that. And part of that is the way we organize. The way we organize is we look at all of the actions, plans, thoughts, and we've figured out immediately, to Kelly's point, and as your video highlighted, we want all of that because we don't have all of that forward. So we do need your engineers, your medical, your logistics, your engineering, your theater port opening. And we've got a plan for all that. So we are organizing ourselves and talking constantly with your leadership about how do we set foundationally where we work together so that you have an understanding, and this is breaking the model. This is, this is something General Hart and I have talked about is, yes, you're globally, assignable but we need to give you regional context so you understand where we need you to fight alongside the active and guard forces when the time comes so we're going to organize ourselves you along with great first army are going to generate the readiness at your home station and we need you to be ready but we're going to give you a, a theater context as to what that is and the mission sets that, that you're going to do so that you can generate the readiness and be prepared to go on whatever timeline has been associated with you know, the mission. But it's one thing to get ready, but it's another thing to go apply it. And that's what we do in, in, in Indo-Pacific and in uh, US Army Pacific is we use Operation Pathways as our way to apply your readiness forward in the theater, mostly west of the international date line so that we can get after the threats at hand. Because what we really need you to do is assist us and provide uh, maneuver options to the commander. And we do that by exercising forward in the theater, whether through the Joint uh, Multipartial Regional Training C Center, JPMRC, which is both in Alaska and Hawaii, and then forward deployable, JPMRX in the Philippines, Australia, Indonesia. We take you with us, so just this past year, Nearly 4,000 reserve forces from 18 of your MSCs came forward in 26 exercises. This year, we're bringing nearly 5,000 of you forward into theater from, again, 18 of your MSCs for 25 exercises. Why? Because we need to fight alongside you. Because at the end of the day, if you're forward, you then allow us to enable joint and tier lines. So we've talked about some challenges. Well, our challenge would be also distance. In our theater, it's really far away, in most cases, from the continental United States. So we need reserve forces forward with their active component, with our allies and partners in a combined joint exercise so that we're training together, we're learning together, and we're ready to hold key terrain. That's what I look forward to talking to you about. I cannot, we cannot do this without you, and we look forward to your questions. Thanks, Kelly. Hey, I appreciate it, sir. So if I get this straight now, the boss has talked about thinking differently, thinking big. General Landis is going to help us enable readiness. Commanders, command teams are going to be responsible for generating that readiness. General Cole talked about he'll make sure we're interoperable with our allies and partners, and they themselves will transform in contact with new equipment, new formations to leverage. And then General Gardner's talked about reserve forward, equipment, people, training, exercises, right? So then I got Mr. Miyamasu, and he's going to talk about some controversial things. So we talk about equipment. So, sir, I'd love for you, and I, and I, love, I love Mr. Miyamasu. I get to finally see him in person because he's always on the Hollywood Squares. But um, those of you who know what I'm talking about, you can chuckle a bit. But I think about our equipment. So what is AMC's role, and how can you help? Because uh, I got a lot of folks with a lot of stuff that we don't need, sir. Uh, absolutely, Kelly. Thank you, General Harder. Uh, 
panel members, thank you for uh, having me here. AUSA, thank you. And then for everybody in the audience, thank you for what uh, you are doing and being here. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, there are some aspects to what the we have learned from the active component uh, in trying to unburden uh, one some of the units from really trying to maintain unnecessary readiness, and it was called the rapid uh, removal of excess. Uh, what we had learned from the active component was there was actually quite a bit of equipment that they had been accumulating over time that actually they were being held responsible for maintaining, even though it wasn't really in some instances on their property book. Uh, in other instances, it was actually uh, old and no longer needed, but it may not necessarily have fallen off their uh, real equipment document. Uh, so uh, running an experiment that went rather quick, it was almost like a, uh, uh, electric uh, shock therapy. We were told to hey, come up with an idea in September. We started it in the beginning of October of 23. And next thing you know, we actually created a process that allowed units to turn things in at, uh, in, we started at Fort Stewart and Fort Liberty to turn in equipment, you know, Ali Ali, income free. You had to have some paperwork, but if you just bring it into these locations, we'll take it off your hands. Uh, resounding success, I would say. A lot of the supply sergeants were overjoyed by the fact that they could actually get part of their supply rooms back. Uh, and at first instance, we really wanted to just test some of these things out. Uh, the second uh, iteration was, hey, we need to probably do this for uh, compost two and three. Uh, why? Because there's the same kind of situation uh, for them. Uh, but it became a little bit harder in the sense that we probably didn't give as much thought to what we needed to do for them because one, it was easier for us to get after those locations that are really close to major uh, active component installations. So I do think that there are some opportunities here for us to get after the other units that are in states where we don't have a major uh, active component installation and kind of work through how do we help them, you, unburden your supply rooms as well as your motor pools? Because I think there are some situations where we have actually equipment that shouldn't be there because we don't use it anymore uh, and you can't even find it on like a history channel anymore. So we probably need to get rid of that. Uh, coming to you soon is also an effort to help with OCIE because I think there's a lot of OCIE hanging out both in the active component and compo three uh, that also needs to move for various reasons. One, you have to get it off your hands. Two, we need to get it back into the system. And then three, uh, maybe ease of process for the NCOs and techs that have to actually deal with all of that. Uh, if we can get a better process in place for them, that might help. Uh, now circling back to one of the points that Kelly brought up, is one of the things that the AMC enterprise and our, our sustainment enterprise really has to pay attention to is version control. What I mean by version control, uh, you can call it variance, variations. If you look at our combat systems, our communication systems, our trucks, uh, we have to pay attention to that we don't put too many variants inside of the Army. Now, we tend to put some in the Compo 1. We try to balance it with, within either Compos 2 or 3, depending upon what it is. But ultimately, the, the purchase decisions that the Army is making uh, is not going to pure fleet us. What we don't want to have is three or four versions of equipment hanging out in Compos 1 and 3. Why? Uh, there is probably some familiarity with keeping the older stuff running and it's probably better in, in that sense because we all kind of know, you know, you hit it over here and it, and it turns the engine on, right? But the reality is the repair parts for these versions tend to not be the same. And so even though we have a truck and it looks like an FMTV, there are some variants where it requires us to have multiple kinds of starters, generators, etc. And all that does is put a big burden on the supply chain because we're not demanding the same amount of things for it. So one of the things, again, we, will, we, we Army and AMC as uh, maybe the senior logistician for the Army 
has to work with the Army staff, uh, the G357, the G4, G8. We have to work with the Secretariat, ASALT, FMNC, OTSG, and then we also have to work with the Army commands. Uh, really, TRADOC in the form of CASCOM, AFC, in the form of the Contested Logistics, CFT, so that we do not have a mismatch of equipment uh, General Kroll was talking about interoperability between countries. We have to be interoperable within our compos. And so we're going to keep working on that. And then finally, the uh, training opportunities. Uh, Kelly, you gave me a great question. I'm probably talking too much, so you can probably tell me to stop at any point. But, well, keep uh, going, sir. Right, this is great. <laughs> okay. They're all listening like, yeah, tell me more about I the don't material know. stuff. We'll see. Um, uh, as far as the training opportunities, there are probably some opportunities that are out there that uh, we have to investigate. So General Harder brought up a, a great perspective of think differently. Now, some of you have heard the, the Secretary and the Chief, other senior leaders talk about continuous transformation. Uh, it kind of manifests itself more in the conversation of transformation and contact. But the reality is we have to think differently. And the reason is, is because we just don't have any more money. No one's gonna give us more money. But there are some opportunities for us to maybe think in a perspective of can the reserves help us in readiness for the active component while gaining T uh, capability inside of their formation. So as uh, General Gardner, uh, one of my wingmen for sustainment in the Indo-Pacific theater has said uh, there are uh, opportunities uh, and he can come up with a lot of them, trust me, for uh, reserve component training out there, but there's also reserve training component opportunities here in, in CONUS. And if we can uh, work through how to get the AT cycle synced up through the Army Synchronization Readiness Conference that FORCECOM runs, uh, we may be able to leverage uh, move, tra transportation, supply capabilities either onto a CTC rotation or either home station training at the major installations where the actual training that the soldiers, the U U.S. Army Reserve soldiers would do would actually be very beneficial for the active component. And again, T benefit resulting in an R benefit, that kind of perspective. And then finally, if we can get uh, some other initiatives done by the Army Material Command in place, there might be some other opportunities for U.S. Army Reserve Forces units to, and, and, and individuals, for that matter, to be able to help us as we start implementing some of these initiatives. Uh, so, sir, uh, thank you for the opportunity to have that uh, question. Over. All right, sir. So you sort of mentioned in T and R and CUSR is coming up. So it's this whole piece, folks are like, oh, I got to make sure my comments are right. But so understand you, sir, modernization over time. We get it. We don't have, you know, an empty, you know, treasure chest full of funds to go after some things. So things will be a little different. So not everyone is going to have the same kit, but our kit has to be interoperable. That's with ourselves, with the joint force, and of course our coalition partners. So I appreciate that, sir. And what I want to do is kind of do a little more riffing here. So we'll put the script off to the side. And I'm going to ask three gentlemen kind of a similar question. So General Landis, you talked about, you know, the the, the tension, the, the kind of the the friction between. GIF map, as I'll call it, the combatant command's insatiable appetite for great Army Reserve resources, which we're happy to give, but we've also got to be ready for large-scale combat operations. So in your mind, like, how do we balance that, and how do we have these difficult conversations across the enterprise for the Army? Um, thanks, Kelly. I, I think this is, uh, this is a great topic for every leader in here, regardless of uh, what unit you're in. Um, you always have too much to do and not enough time to do it. And we used to, uh, I used to go with General Allen when we would brief the PCCs and all the brigade and battalion commanders would say, hey, tell us just what not to do. Just tell us what to focus on. And, and I remember his answer. He's like, you know, I can do that, but it's going to take me a couple weeks and figure out what your unit is. And, and then I'll figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are. And I'll figure out where you should do that and not do this. And, and if I'm doing that all for you, then why do I have brigade and battalion commanders? Um, and so we've given you a whole list of stuff to do just to kind of as a guide, but then it's really amongst you all to do the, the intellectual before you do the physical. And you, when you're looking at LISCO versus COCOM demand, you're really starting with what's the task? You know, what am I have to be good for this? And is, is there anything common? Anything common? And what are those things that are foundational and fundamental? 
and how many reps and sets do I need to do on these and how long before they degrade? And that goes into the calendar first. And then once you have that, you're, you're like, how can I do multi-compo or multi-echelon training in order to do a couple of twofers? I was get, just getting briefed uh, by somebody today. She was like, hey, I can do this and that. And I was like, man, I'm all in for a twofer. You know what I'm saying? And if you can give me a threefer, then, then I'm gonna put that on the calendar first because now I'm really getting to maximizing. But then, then what you're gonna to have to do is all this stuff that falls out. Once you put the things that are the most important into the time, all that stuff that falls out, then you ought, you know, we say prudent risk, but the prudent risk is you can only accept risk that you can cover at your level. As soon as it, it, it spills out, you have to brief your higher prudent risk. And so as a young company commander, I remember going to my battalion commander uh, General Bernie Shampoo at the time, and, and back that was before PowerPoint, I'd write out something, I'd literally take a pen and write a red line and write all the stuff that I wasn't gonna do below the red line. And he'd be like, hey Mark, I really, I really don't like that below the red line, so if we pull that up, what has to come down? It wasn't just pull up and do more. He's like, if I get this one above the red line, what are these tasks that you wanna do that are gonna go below? And I'd be like, this one and this one could go below the red line. And that is commander dialogue, in whatever way that you wanna do it. You know, it used to be the QTBs or just this meeting, company commander, battalion commander, where they're like, hey, I can't get to all this stuff. And then you start, you're assessing, hey, where's the risk? Now, if you're not gonna do this stuff, what are we not gonna be ready for? And in some cases, you're passing that risk to me. And if you're transparent for it, all I'm doing is resource and post mode in order to do it. But at some point, you're gonna have to brief General Pappas and say, hey boss, you want this capability, it's not gonna be available at D minus. It's not even gonna be available till D plus this because of these things. And once you do that, then I, then I think we're gonna to get to really being able to, to understand what's important and where we can do the tension. I don't know if that gets it. No, it does. I think, uh, to kind of add on to that, I think one thing that we're terrible at in the Army Reserve, harder included, right, is articulating risk, just as General Landis just said. And when you articulate risk, it's not risk to you or your formation, mildly interesting, right? Mildly interesting. Why do you exist? What is your purpose? I think probably the, I was General Stultz's XO, and we went in to brief General Odierno, uh, and General Odierno was looking for dollars uh, to fund BCTs and all the right things for the Army, and he turned to General Stultz and said, hey Jack, I think I'm gonna to have to reduce the Army Reserve. I can't remember the number, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000. Uh, just need to reduce that force structure because I need the balance to get after something in my portfolio. And General Stoltz turned to the chief and said, hey sir, I got it. What capabilities do you not want? I'm not delivering fuel to the Army Reserve. I'm delivering it to the 101st Airborne Division. I'm not flying the Army Reserve. I'm flying first ID. We're terrible at that, my personal opinion. And so we gotta do a lot better of articulating that risk because I tell you, we have commanders, General Pappas, General Landis, we have commanders that are all in on backing us when we articulate that risk and pushing back on, hey, why is the Army Reserve getting this gift map requirement? We need that formation for LISCO, but we gotta be able to tell that story. So that's, I, I mean, I agree with everything you said, Mark. That's what we got to do a better job as a compo of articulating that risk, that risk to total Army and the nation, not to, not to the Army Reserve. Yes, sir. So I'm going to throw it over to General Kroll, uh, because from a risk perspective, you've got a, uh, a war to your east. So you've got to balance these new requirements of getting these new sets of reserve capabilities, these new training capabilities. There's got to be things that you just cannot get to. How do you see you know, assessing that risk and then managing that risk. Uh, okay, uh, from uh, the Polish perspective, uh, we are uh, constantly exposed to threat, and this threat is imminent every day. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, hybrid attacks on Polish border every day. Uh, we have attacks on uh, Polish transformation uh, 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 transportation uh, uh, systems, uh, communication systems, uh, our networks, uh, military, civilian. Uh, you, you should also take into consideration that in Poland, the biggest hub supporting uh, all kinds of uh, humanitarian and military support to Ukraine is located. 
So we are also, uh, uh, I would say, primary potential target for Russians in case, uh, for Russians in case they would wish to uh, 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 attack. So we have to be simply prepared with proper capabilities. Uh, we are also exposed to uh, uh, attacks uh, uh, in cognitive domain. Our uh, uh, citizens uh, uh, are uh, 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 trying to be, our society uh, uh, is exposed to different uh, types of uh, uh, information, uh, not necessarily in uh, 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 TV or, or in the radio, because uh, um, uh, this is uh, in Polish hands. However, internet is free. So the, these attacks to uh, uh, divide society are uh, uh, also uh, uh, the threat I have to, I have to underline. Uh, but I'd like to uh, uh, turn your attention also on the fact that uh, it's also important for you to understand that the Poland is going to defend itself as a first responder and meet Article 3 Washington Treaty means create and build as a uh, 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 huge and capable armed forces to be able to 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 uh, 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 to win the war as well. But from the other perspective, we are in NATO. So in NATO, uh, in order to enable your readiness as well, we count on your support in case our uh, uh, resources. Uh, uh, won't be enough. Our capabilities won't be enough. So we are also not only in charge for defense, but also uh, uh, enabling your deployment to Poland. So this, you should take this into consideration. Mm -hmm. Every year we spend $250 million to ensure that U.S. troops are properly hosted in Poland. We uh, uh, build a, a, a APS the most modern uh, on the planet in order to ensure that you and uh, uh, your personnel, your reserve uh, 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 personnel, our brothers in arms, uh, will be able to uh, uh, receive proper support on the spot. Okay? So uh, 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 our current uh, 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 priorities are definitely on uh, building this defense own defense capabilities. However, this ability to absorb uh, 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 U.S. troops and other NATO countries' uh, uh, support is also uh, uh, under development. Sir, thank you. I just remind folks, I heard under constant attack, physically, the cognitive space, influence operation across multiple domains, contested, congested, I think you described an MDO environment, something that we are trying ourselves to really understand how we look. When you think of our partners, it's not just that interoperability, sir, it's to learn together so that we can be stronger as those partners. What I'm gonna do is for our final question to the panel, I'm gonna open it up here in just a few minutes, so please get your questions ready. I know there's some folks really wanna get up there. Uh, I'm gonna hand over to General Gardner. So, sir, you heard about this contested, under attack, what that looks like. You know, Poland and the, their, their Homeland Defense Act what does this mean in your theater? You're staring at this, quite frankly, in a different manner than we're sitting over here thousands of miles away. How do you think about this, sir? Yeah, so thanks. But first, because I, I know Miles talked about something, so I know there's some, uh, some spouses out there too. So when he talks about getting rid of excess OCIE, I know on a personal level, I have five duffel bags <laughs> and one tough box that are in my basement and garage that I'm pretty sure my spouse would love for me to turn in. So, Miles, I'm taking you up on that All one. Right. So, uh, so, look, you know, we know that the strength of our military and the strength of our army is our ability to project and sustain combat power. But that's at risk. Uh, and it's at risk of the same thing as General Kroll talked about with just as capable of adversary. So four of the five national defense strategy adversaries reside in the Indo-PACOM. So it's you know, the elephant in the room, it's China, it's Russia, it's the DPRK, i.e. North Korea, and there's violent extremist organizations. But those top three are obviously looking for ways to slow us down. So our ability to project and sustain combat power is only going to work with our COMPO3 partners and your ability to, to open 
theater ports, and operations. And so we are looking to how we reorganize ourselves to make sure that we are identifying the key capabilities. And I'm not talking about individuals, I'm talking about units. It is units that are gonna do this, not individuals. So, sir, I don't want joint augmentees. We want capabilities. We need companies, we need battalions, we need brigades. And you need to know the terrain and locations that we need you to go forward with. And we're gonna pull you forward. And we're gonna apply you in the theater through operations, exercises, whether it's war fighters, computer post exercises, those academic things that stretch large formations you know, ESC, TSC headquarters, sustainment brigades, you know, the, the 200th MP uh, br uh, command. We want to stress that at that level from the fundamental staff portion so you understand the terrain and all the challenges associated with it that we can fill you up. But then at the tactical level, we need you to operate on the ground. And the only way you're going to get better with an ally and partner is to be on the ground because every country is unique. Every country is unique, so we need you to get you forward. So we're gonna pull you forward during your AT, and we're gonna get after it. And the other part is, we know that the distance is real. So one of the ways you overcome th through that is through pre-positioning. That's pre-position of supplies, that's pre-position of equipment, and that is pre-positioning of understanding of, I know where I'm going, I know the people I talk to, I understand the challenges associated with it, and I've worked with that ally or partner on the ground so that when this thing goes, I'm ready. And that's the way we're gonna get past it that was a change from how we've done things in the past. Been very good about doing this with our NATO partners for years. Uh, there is no NATO in the Pacific, but there's a lot of mutual defense treaties and we've got a lot of folks that really are looking forward to training with us each and every day. And so we're gonna, we're gonna break, the, break the paradigm and we're bringing you forward because we have to. Uh, and it's our job to rightly anticipate this, forecast it, work it through Forcecom, as Miles talked about at the ASRC, which is the world's most painful conference for those that have been there. You know what I'm talking about? There's not enough coffee in the world, all right? But if we do our job in the theater and plan it out five years in advance, and I, I'm serious, five years in advance, we can lay out an intelligent plan that resources us with the assistance of obviously your commander First Army, and get you ready to come out and train on the, on the, on the fields that you need to be at. Thanks, Kelly. No, sir, thing. I think just for the audience anyway, you've heard me talk about it. I think folks even here yesterday were arguing with me over like, well, I sent five people here. Hey, I'm great, good Americans, awesome. It did zero to generate readiness. If you wanna see an army that's focused on readiness, listen to the chief's word, the secretary's word, the sergeant major of the army's word. We have to build units ready for combat. And we will have the opportunities for individuals to go where they go to kind of you know, tune themselves up for staff positions and whatnot. But I heard, sir, you heard from USRAPAC, the same thing at USRAPAC, the conversations we have, we've got to get to units. It doesn't happen overnight. So when I hear things like, hey, they want somebody six runs from now, say no. The boss has said, help me understand what we're trying to do in building readiness before we say yes. And I think, sir, you just hit the nail on the head and I appreciate that. So what I'm about to do here is just a couple things. One, thanking the panel up front. We're gonna let this free flow. I'd like to see some folks stand up. I want you to ask the hard questions. If not, then uh, I might get fired here, but um, I know you all have some. This is the panel that can answer the questions and we will take those RFIs back and we've gotta do digging on it. So, and I know most of you in the room, so I will start calling on folks if I don't see people get up. Lots of folks engaging me in the hallway. Now's the time to be bold. All right, here they start. <laughs> no warrant right, officers, no chaplains. Microphones, and, oh, here we go. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Tom South, Army Times. Um, all of what you're trying to do obviously involves people, I know that's not forgotten. Um, the uh, active duty army is looking to increase its uh, recruiting goal by 6,000 next year. The Guard is going to be uh, plusing up by 1,000. The Guard is going to be starting at 126. What's the Reserve doing as far as retention and recruiting? What's you seeing there? What challenges you're seeing? No, I appreciate that. Thank you. I think, in a, you know, I'll turn it over to, I got some teammates here, A car, D car, DCG, my command sergeant major uh, here, command chief probably in here somewhere. But, you know, one of, the, one of our challenges, so right now, uh, we're exceeding kind of our retention goals. Um, I know when I was, you know, General Daniels, D car, then you keep raising the goal, right? I mean, you don't give yourself a high five, you know, for, setting the standard too low and then smashing it, right? And so I think we, uh, and we just keep doing that, but our, I think our commands are doing a great job. Uh, on the recruiting piece, and we talk about thinking big, right? So on the recruiting piece, 
Uh, right now, um, and I have, uh, we have a meeting coming up with the chief to kind of talk about Army Reserve recruiting, right? But, but COMPO 1 is making some strides. Uh, but the United States Army Recruiting Command also recruits for Compo 3 for the Army Reserve. So they got that mission set for us. Um, and we, we have almost 1,500 uh, Army Reserve soldiers committed to that enterprise uh, that, are, that are recruiters or supporting recruiting. But, but quite frankly, USAREC has missed that mission for us. They're hitting about 70 to 75%. And uh, Will Mofleet, I saw him in here, but he can correct me if I'm wrong. I think we're short about 9,000. E4 and below, right? Uh, and so that's the challenge. And so I, I tell you, one thing I would add to this, though, it, it's talking to General Davis, Johnny Davis, awesome human being. I think there's a perception that recruiting is a zero-sum game. If I get an Army Reserve soldier, that's one compo, one soldier that I lose. And I actually met with a vendor yesterday talking AI, kind of working some predictive maintenance, but also predictive talent management. And hey, listen, this is what we can do. We've actually done some modeling for corporate America where if you want this person to be, we can identify based upon characteristics and data sets, people that you hire, they're gonna be gone in a year, and people that you hire that might still be there in 10 years. And we're working that with basic training. Here's a, here's a young recruit we can look at that we think is gonna make it through basic training. I kind of said, I might really be interested if you can tell me, hey, what is that data set that says, here's, here's, a, here's a great American more prone to Army Reserve Service than wanting to be in a BCT. If you can help me with that, you got my attention. So I think that's how we kind of leverage technology to think differently and, and kind of help ourselves out. But we, and strength is a challenge. And uh, what I have told my team, no one's gonna care what your manning is when the balloon goes up. No one's gonna care. You're getting on the, you're getting on the plane. Just like General Garden was talking about earlier, what General Landis said, we got folks that are needed at D minus. And so we got to continue, uh, our commanders will continue to get after that. But I think we got to leverage technology. Deb Katulich was part of the Secretary's recruiting initiative. And we just got to think differently, and we're getting after that. So thanks for that. Hey, sir. So I can add, so, sir, I think one of the things, what can we do to help the Army? Um, and the Army's come a long way on the G1 side of the House. So we'll talk about direct commissioning. So, you know, you've, you know, chaplains, you know, medical officers, dentists, you know, the chaplains. There's folks that we directly commission, you know, as a, as a habit. We have directed, you know, folks that are working on those things, but the system is fairly antiquated. So we went through a process, started directly commissioning our own folks for the Army Reserve, right into the Army Reserve. Master's degrees, PhDs, folks that have data science, back, I mean, some of the folks, the researchers out there. The folks that we need to not only win on the battlefield, but also as we look at competition and interacting with not just our active component, um, but also our allies and partners. So G1 went through and we've fixed a lot of, you know, Six Sigma using reserve component folks to understand what that process looks like and actually improve it. So now we can get to that commission faster. And now we're working through the process of what schools, like think big, think differently, what am I going to teach a PhD level person who understands influence operations because they got a degree in psychology? I'm, I'm pretty sure they can change, you know, have me change my mind. So what <laughs> schools do they need in the Army to allow them to practice what we need them to practice on the battlefield? And we've got to learn our way through that. So that's a piece where we can leverage both internal to the Army Reserve, our National Guard partners, but also Comp 1 to understand what that looks like for the future because I'll bet there are folks that work for my company, PayPal, that never thought about the Army, but they're 30, 40 years old, but have the capability of coming into service to serve our nation in the things that they're already talented at. So that's another way I think about how we could, we could leverage that. We're gonna go over to the right side, and I can't see with the lights blinding. I know we've got a white jacket over there. That's right, so. sir. <clears throat> Lieutenant Colonel Gordy, I'm at the 351st Civil Affairs out of Silicon Valley, functional specialty group. And we're talking forward, we're talking there's a little bit of restructuring conversation going on downstairs with the active duty and being able to articulate risk. So I just came from joint staff on ADOS, second tour, and what I see on the active side is the lack of understanding of the reserve forces capabilities, especially when it comes to lines of effort such as partners and allies, influencing and information, and those forces only rely, lie within the Army Reserve not the National Guard, which is constantly confused with partners and allies, but that's at a tactical level. These units are specifically designed for theater, theater level within the PACOM region to solve wicked problems with industry experts. So we're all coming from something in law or business or 
agriculture, economics, and we simply, nobody knows we exist. General Dickerson was actually one of the founders of this program. Um, fantastic he program. He did not. <laughs> but but he no, did it's not. my figure that the Joint Staff doesn't know about. It. Yeah. yeah. It's also so when we talk about the ability to put these assets with our active duty, a theater level asset, not a tactical level asset, do we need to look at the way we're restructuring and the way we get funding aligned with special ops or whoever it may be so we can, in fact, deploy quickly and reduce that risk on a large national scale? Should I take that one? No. All right, so that's, a, that's a great question. I think there's... Let me say okay, something. So and, and, and I'd love to get Gavin's yeah. percep perception on. I th and then, of course, you. <laughs> Since you obviously jacked it up, and I want to hear how you're going to fix it. The, uh, no, I think, um, I, so one of the things I think about, right, is managing, uh, y you know, relevancy of the Army Reserve, uh, which we're very relevant right now, given the capabilities, the unique capabilities we have, you just clearly articulated, versus, and I get this from the audience, so any question on this would be great, um, it, you know, the op tempo that we put our soldiers through. And they are Army Reserve soldiers, and their civilian jobs are paying a mortgage. Right, so it's balancing that operational, you know, capability, what we bring to the fight versus maintaining relevancy. And I think the key is uh, we, we got to better articulate our capabilities. But, you know, I had a senior leader engage me and talk about, um, hey, would you be better served as an Army Reserve if you had, their word, augmentees, more IMAs, more small plugs into Compo 1 right, that could bring this unique capability and really help us out. And that's, I think that's, we absolutely have the, the expertise to provide that. Where I'm concerned is a lot of kids want to be part of a team, a formation, a unit that is going out and doing something as that team formation and unit. That's what we recruit against, and that's how you maintain your end strength. Um, we have, a, as a first commander, I had, I had a slice into the Corps, 18th Airborne Corps. Those kids were awesome. They were a great team. Uh, General Donahue wanted them all the time, often more than we could actually, those kids could do. And so we continue to work through that. So I think it's the balance of how do you bring the skill sets and enable what civil affairs can do, and then the, but also maintain enough relevancy as a formation to be able to recruit against that. Because I, I know some IMAs can get very frustrated with, hey, I come in, they don't give me any work, I'm, I'm only here 90 days a year, I plug in here, I have no idea what's going on, I'm gone in 10 days, and so I got to stay away from that. Civil affairs and some of those small teams, not so much like that. But, you know, for Gavin, uh, in, the pay, in the PACOM area, and he kind of just mentioned, don't need augmentees, need units, w what is your take on capabilities that you think Compo 1 is not fully tracking? and to any other panel members and how we can do a better job of articulating. Hey, sir, first uh, three beats, two. So I'm going to hand it to Joe Cole first. Okay. Ah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, uh, as an operational planner, I'd like to explain you a little bit how it works as far as defining these requirements on theater or operational level. Uh, so, uh, in 2022, the whole year, uh, all three operation, NATO operation commands, at least, uh, we tried to define the proper requirements uh, that were finally listed uh, in operation, uh, uh, regional plans. Uh, approximately, uh, sorry, uh, uh, approximately 1,500 pages, uh, at least for center. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, 16 nations. Uh, and these plans are uh, tested at this moment in different training and exercises. Uh, General Williams touched uh, uh, his land domain, uh, but from the, the joint uh, uh, operational perspective, uh, we should already be prepared to uh, execute multi-domain operations. This cognitive uh, aspect is important. Information aspect is important. And uh, uh, we learn as we train. So, uh, of course, this the, uh, proper detailed answer can be uh, provided to you today, but uh, there will be time. I'm 100% sure uh, uh, for, for, for uh, uh, the Polish reservists and uh, the US and uh, every country, we will train with you uh, definitely uh, 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 and define what is really required. Uh, yeah. Plans are plans, but, but we have to exercise them uh, in order to uh, uh, properly define in details what is what is required and sir so 
The 351st Civil Affairs Command is aligned to our theater, and I can assure you at every opportunity we reach in and ask them to participate not only in exercises, but it really is, you know, from a civil affairs, as you know, it, it's about relationships. And so where we can identify, in this case, where, where you do have, you know, country expertise, regional expertise, especially in areas whether it's rule of law, governance, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, or quite frankly, with certain countries, they really don't want to talk about large-scale combat operations. But they're all about talking about, hey, how can we work our way through humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, which unfortunately in, in the area I live in, you know, about you know, five-eighths of the world's disasters happen there you know, every year. So you know, that's where we do leverage that capability. But at the end of the day, if we don't program it out on a known exercise, it ends up being a pickup game, which is not helpful to anybody, to your point. 100%, sir. Thank you. Awesome. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, CSM Cox from 497 Combat Support Sustainment Battalion. On the topic of modernization, what is the Army Reserve procurement plan on commu uh, commercial communication systems such as Starlink? Uh, for example, my battalion, when we go to the field, we have no organic communication systems, but we're expected to still maintain during battle assembly. And also, uh, what is the plan on simplifying computer system access for reservists? The, the move to, three, to Office 365 didn't really help because now with the, the expectation of our soldiers of checking their emails and reaching our systems is behind a VPN that costs more data is not as simple as it used to be. The Army constantly gives us these good ideas and then takes them back and put them behind a firewall. So we can blame the G6. <laughs> as always. As always. Uh, I won't, Kelly, if you want to talk to the, the modernization piece, because um, I, you know, the whole procurement piece and where we're going with that. I, I will tell you where, where the, my formations out here can help me is use what you got, right? And General Landis might be able to uh, comment on this because we can make the argument for more sustainment and, and you know, Miles was talking about interoperability and where we have to be. Uh, but in my recent time visit in CSTX, uh, even with the comms that we had, it took us like eight days into the exercise to really get after it, right? And so it, it, it gives senior leaders maneuver space if we're making the most of what we have and then we can articulate that risk. It, 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 it makes it a little bit harder when we talk about no interoperability and there's, there's an inch of dust on the system we're supposed to be using. So, but Mark, I, I mean, I, Kelly, if you want to talk some of Yeah, that. just a little bit, Sue, just from a modernization perspective, you know, Mr. Mouse, talked about not everybody gets the same kit at the same time as we modernize. And the reality is, is some of our kit, quite frankly, it's, it's, it is antiquated. Um, it doesn't talk to the active component. And we've seen that when we went to a CTC exercise last year and the unit had to use their, their organic equipment, Army Reserve, and the active component couldn't use their high-end systems to talk to them and they actually degraded a bit. But that is a well-known piece. So when you talk about there's two efforts happening right now that the Army Reserve is actively participating in these OPTs. So you've got C2 Fix, which is Heath's way of saying, let's make sure we understand what we're going to have to communicate, when we're going to communicate it, and how that's interoperable, not just you know, across the Army, the Joint Force, and our partners. That's the immediate fix piece of this. Then there's C2 Next. How do we deliver data at scale, you know, in a contested environment? So the Army Reserve is also a part of that, along with the National Guard. So we're all in that, con that conversation. What it comes down to is, is where you are in line, and this part of the regional alignment that we're doing through ForceCom is that if you are a reserve component force aligned to a theater army, and on that tip fit, it looks like, even though you're a globally available force, right, sir, so gotta make sure you keep that in there, but who's most likely to go, let's who's that's most ready to go, and making sure those forces are getting that kit in time and space so they are interoperable. And we think about CTC rotations, making sure that what kit we have early in the cycle, that's why we're at the, the ASARC, that painful meeting that I think is one of the best things we have, to integrate and synchronize what, you know, what forces are gonna go to what exercises, it identifying right there two, three years out, what communication systems am I gonna be required to leverage? That means that if you're in command right now, you're actually planning for something that you won't be a part of three years from now, four years from now. That's as, as commanders and command teams, and we've gotta push back up through the USARC, and I'm sure that General Klein sitting there would say, if you need it, we'll get it and you'll be in line to get that for the, that not just the equipment itself, but the training to get us there. So it's not a, trying to be a, 
political answer to this, but the reality is we will get the things we need when we need it, but we've got to identify what those resources are as we plan for it. Sir? No, I agree with you totally. The, to get to your question, there's twofold. I do, I do agree with you. We put a lot of things behind the CAC. I, there's a lot of ways that are not out of CAC that we don't advertise well. You can enroll your own advice and stuff like that, and they'll put the certs on your phone. And so there's a lot the Army's trying to do to get away from uh, VPNs and stuff like that. We just need to get that information out. Uh, we've enrolled a lot of our advice. I know that's you know, you're paying for your own cell phone now. You're using it for work, but um, there is that. The other thing I'll tell you is the same thing I was saying. When you figure out what you want to communicate, I don't think you care what the wavelength is. And so if you're just looking for kit in order to simulate something, I think there's plenty in the Army that we can get so that you can you can get the reporting and stuff like that that you can do for training. Because I totally agree with Kelly. There, There is going to be when you go, uh, a, a, they're going to give you a bunch of new stuff as they always do. And so if you get tied up into this is what I always do on this piece of kit, that kit's going to change multiple times. It's, you know, what am I having to tell? You know, you know what, am I, what am I receiving and what am I doing with that information? If you have that process down, I think we'll work the, the box yeah. that actually sends it. Yeah. That's a great point. Good morning, panel. I think this is the most significant panel of the conference, and thank you. Um, I think my comment is mainly towards General Gardner, but I really need input maybe from the left. And perhaps uh, to General Harder's point, all of our hallway conversations. My question is not a reserve aviation question, it's a reserve question, which is we feel the, the pull from the theaters. USARAF and Fifth Corps, we feel that. We feel it from Indo-PACOM and USARPAC, and there's no question we want to partner with you. But uh, safety tip, better do what your boss says. And Freedom 6 needs us, and we're all in. And we partner with First Army. And maybe my question is, is GRAF sufficient or is it more? Is JPMRC sufficient or is it more? Because we can't keep doing the pickup games if Freedom 6 doesn't see the value. And I think a lot of MSCs feel that. How do we ensure that the theater training is getting after what Freedom 6 needs us to also get after, or we're going to continue to feel the tension on this side of the panel. Um, your thoughts, sir? Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm all about doing what my boss says, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a leadership technique. Might be career enhancing, too. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> hey, look, you know, from a, from a user PACS perspective, I, you know, I think from our, our, our lens, clearly, you know, we are trying to fill a gap and really deter forward, quite frankly. And deterring from the continent of the United States, probably not seen by the people it needs to be seen but from not only a allies and partners, which I would start there first. Because if you're not forward, you're not really there. And so there is the deterrent effect of with allies and partners forward on their ground where we want that key terrain forward, where we want to be for positional advantage, that obviously drives us as a theater army to ask to bring the reserve forces forward. Clearly the adversary sees it as well. So that's, that's a given. So you know, we're always gonna ask to bring you forward. And clearly understanding when it comes to AT time, that's a large pull to bring you all the way out to the Pacific. It's a great plane ride, let me tell you. So, you know, and it really gets you know, the, the, the joy of distance. But if I can get you 10 days forward in the Philippines, Indonesia, South Korea, Japan, that is unbelievably powerful from an allies and partners in readiness from the theater army. Fully understanding that you gotta be globally assignable, clearly understanding Freedom Six, Freedom Six's concerns. So, but if we do our job and lay it out over time and space, that's what we want to do. And it doesn't just have to be forward. You know, I'm challenging my own team to make sure that we are coming to your location and we're see, seeing you on a drill weekend and how do we leverage that time to give you that viable theater information so that you don't get dragged to the Pacific. Exactly. Yeah. We owe you that as well. You know, I think that's a great point. The thing that I would tell you, and, and we really need to make sure if you do the work and you know the tasks that need to be trained, what you've got to do is you've got to project 
to the user, hey, I'm, I'll come out there, but you have got to facilitate this training. And I'll give you NTC, for example. I think we make a mistake sometimes with NTC in the fact that we answer the CSSB requirement, but we never tell NTC, hey, this is what you're going to have to do for us. We're just providing to them, USAR is, but we ought to put a requirement on them hey, we'll come do your fuel and stuff like that, but I need you to train these tasks and these ranges, and we never put the requirement on the user to, to provide you the readiness builders. That's great. Hey, so I'd love to, uh, Mr. Mimasi, just to, to kind of that point. We talked about being forward, exercising forward, forward positioning. Can you talk a little bit about um, APS or forward positioning, things from an AMC perspective that'll be a challenge for us and how you guys are thinking about it over? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Uh, so. The APS uh, strategy, if you might, uh, currently in existence, which will probably go through a modification and re rewrite, is now looking at addressing the real questions of where should we be and what should be in it. Uh, and we are actually under these discussions to determine where, where on the ground uh, these things should be. Now, there are some things that are are changing some assumptions in the past that uh, about host nation support that are actually turning assumptions much closer to facts. Uh, General Kroll uh, in Poland and their efforts are an example of where host nations are doing more and uh, allowing for uh, giving us greater authorities to operate in countries. Uh, General uh, Gardner is in his previous experience and in his current experience is actually being involved in additional expansive uh, uh, discussions and efforts uh, to include beyond just Australia. So we need to find what is the right location and what should go in it. That's one. Number two, we also have to come up with a strategy for uh, exercising the equipment and maintaining it while it's there. And the reason why I bring that up is, is that there is a cost to maintaining equipment uh, uh, for long-term storage, depending upon the kinds of conditions you have it in. But however that condition is, we still have to maintain that equipment. It's not like maintaining uh, Compo 1 equipment, if you might. It probably even looks a lot like how the reserves actually have to maintain their equipment over a multi-year perspective. And so as we start to look at what ultimately will be uh, recommendations to the Secretary of the Army and Secretary of Defense as to where we might want to put equipment down on the ground uh, globally, uh, there are some opportunities, though, for us to also get it right, meaning whatever's inside of that should probably be the things that help support operational plans, help support uh, tip fids, help support early deployer requirements, uh, but most importantly is the kinds of equipment that uh, are most necessary for success in the combatant command theaters. So, uh, Kelly, a lot more work to, to happen, but I think we're, we're actually starting to see some of the uh, change starting to manifest itself in both the both of the priority uh, pacing theaters, both uh, Indo-PACOM and UCOM, both those theaters are starting to see some activity that might lend itself to uh, some positive effects for the joint force. Thanks, for Joko. Uh, I'd like to turn your attention on uh, the fact that at this moment we have uh, uh, very much co cohesive three types of plans, NATO, US, and national plans. And these plans uh, clearly states uh, uh, how we are going to deploy troops, how we are going to uh, 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 exercise our integration training. Uh, however, f at least from my perspective, uh, uh, we are in fact uh, to some extent uh, missing understanding that we need to sustain the equipment that we deploy to the, uh, 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 to, to the areas. Uh, I know that there is a discussion uh, uh, whether to uh, redeploy this equipment from Europe to US or uh, 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 service uh, uh, and maintain it somewhere in, in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, Poland recently acquired a huge amount of US equipment and we will build these capabilities in Poland. There is no other chance that we will uh, deploy them to US for, for maintenance <laughs> and service. Uh, this would be ridiculous. 
we offer you to join this uh, uh, effort and simply develop proper capabilities, uh, 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 factories that, 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 that could do that simply for us and for you and for other users of the same type of equipment. Awesome. All right, so we're going to do this. We're going to take these three questions. So shoot, please. Uh, good morning. I'm a Colonel Toussaint. I'm a French Army Reserve. Uh, my question is about uh, readiness. Uh, from what I understand, you have 39 days at home unit to p get ready, and then uh, serve at First Army. You have some amount of time at your last line of defense to provide that readiness to the to the COCOMs. And how do you see the difference in time of it takes you to uh, prepare units for common uh, current COCOM requirement uh, as opposed to possible uh, large scale operation? What is the gap in time uh, that you will need to work on, sir? You know, there's, um, it's just a math problem. And so it really depends on the manning of the unit and its state of readiness. And so uh, this is where I, I talk about transparency. And so there's a list of tasks that need to be done for a COCOM and there's a list of tasks that need to be done for large scale ground combat. And if, if I know where the unit is at, then we just, we, we're just doing the time and space analysis to get them. But regardless, the C2, you know, there's a certain level of readiness that the Army is going to require out of that unit. And in order to achieve that, there's a, a medal, you know, and that they have to achieve, and that's where we're going to do it. And if we focus on the blocking and tackling, those tasks that are common to both, I think the, the time requirement will, will be different, but not huge, if that answers it. Um, hello. Um, <laughs> yeah. Give her help. Come on. I'm, I'm very short. Yeah. Just going to tilt it. Okay. There you go. Um, uh, <laughs> so uh, this has been a great panel. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm with uh, Lido's Defense Systems. Um, I'm. We talked a lot about things that need to change. If you guys had no limitations, what would be the priority on something that you'd like to see modernized? Wow. No limitations. Um, so we got to get after the end strength piece that was brought up earlier, right? Because we got to be able to man our formations. Uh, but what I've said to my team a couple times um, is, if if I was Thanos and I had the I had the gauntlet with all five Infinity Stones and I could snap my fingers, right? Some of my teammates would wonder if they're still here if they turned to dust. <laughs> Obviously but but I tell you what, I would I would get rid of five to six hundred Army Reserve Centers, and I'd have six or seven more Fort McCoys spread across the country. Where I see where I see units driving readiness is where they are within. You know, they can get to the Fort Dixes, the Fort McCoys, Camp Shelby's, partnering up with the Guard, the Fort Liberties, and, and you've got commanders engaged at echelon driving readiness. I can't maintain the reserve centers. The McCoys of the world give me incredible training. If resource was no limited, that's what I would drive on. Thank you. No pressure. Final question. Good morning, gentlemen. First Sergeant Deirdre, 449 Engineer Company, uh, Fort Thomas, Kentucky. I have a, a question. It's kind of a two-parter. Um, we are currently working with equipment that's 50-plus years old, and we don't have enough of that. So when we go to do training at NTC, we get uh, expectations from them that we cannot fulfill because we don't have the correct equipment. Is there a way to have the active duty look at their equipment and see if there's anything they can push down so that we can get updated equipment and equipment that we can train on? Um, secondly, if we were to push forward into theater and gear is staged there, um, we would have training that we've done on the equipment that we have, and now we would have new equipment, and we would have to change our, our entire plan of operations or at least adapt it to new equipment. Um, are we looking at a way that we can do that ahead of time and get that training in before we would go overseas? I'll be quick, then, if any other, I mean, Miles may have something to it at AMC. I think, so I'm unaware that we got formations with equipment that's 50 years old, so I see Sully standing right next to you, so we'll, I'm sitting right next to you, I apologize. So we'll, uh, we'll figure that out, right? But I think the cascading of equipment from Compo 1 and Compo 2 sometimes, that works for us. 
engineer type equipment, engineer formations, very difficult to maintain. It's not lost on me, right? So I think one of the ways that I think we have to get after this, it kind of gets what we've been talking about here. Prepositioning pre -positioning equipment sets forward uh, that we can afford to maintain or we get help from the great Gavin Gardeners, Gardeners of the world and uh, Miles uh, and AMC Enterprise and then smaller equipment sets that we then can procure and modernize that the units have. And we have to figure out what that right balance is. That is, that is something we're gonna have, and it's not just in the engineer world. It's, it's, I mean, we don't have the new trucks, for example, some of the transportation equipment, and, but our kids will be falling in on that. So how do we bridge that gap? So that is, that is something that we're driving on all the time, really, looking at that equipment, interoperability. Thank you. Miles, anything you want to add to that? Uh, well, it's always tough following a three-star, sir. So, uh, no, sir, what I would say is that the uh, there are some decisions that the Army can probably help us out with uh, on a from a DARPOL perspective, from a prioritization. There's only so much equipment that does exist, uh, and that probably goes to a rank ordering of units. That's one perspective. Uh, the other perspective is maybe taking a S hitting an S rating hit. So what do I mean by that? Maybe the Army should consider looking at uh, going across the uh, other compos, one through six, to be quite honest, where we take equipment out and consider using some kind of a uh, so what. You know, now you have this pool of equipment that probably could either fill the most pressing needs, could fill the preposition opportunities if that's how we would want to do it, but uh, it gives us a pool for at least to make some decisions. And then the third thing, you know, really to answer the Lido's question, if I had, uh, you know, excess resources, what would I do? Well, I'd probably build, rebuild our OIB. There are some industrial base depots, uh, ammo plants and arsenals that probably could use some uh, modernization that might be able to then turn and the repair of some of the equipment that the first sergeant was talking about faster uh, and that would probably help everybody uh, not only uh, the, that first sergeant but also all three compos plus compo six so um, a lot of inter interconnected approaches that could help uh, but we'd probably need to also look, and I'm not even sure it's a stepwise approach, meaning do you have to have the equipment on hand before you can make these decisions? I think if you kind of threw some things out there, says these are the things we might want to do, kind of gives you some opportunity to make some decisions on how much equipment we actually might have to pull together. Sir. Thanks. Hey, sir, over to you for some closing comments. I tell you what, this has been awesome. I know we're a little bit over. I really appreciate everybody's support. I, some of the panel members might have to break contact, but if not, it'd be great in just a few minutes if folks have some other questions. Thank you all for what you do, right? I would just echo something my battle buddy here, General Landis, said, it kind of implied, right? Don't ask for permission to do your job if you're a leader in this room. You kind of know where the Army Reserve's going. Uh, get after it, articulate risk. Uh, and it's our job to make sure we provide the top cover, and we'll continue to do that. So thank you, sir, for your job.